Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman, and we're taking a look today at the Synology DS218J. This is their low-end model that uh, starts at around $169 without any drives installed, and I figured it would be uh, good to kind of check in on the low end of the Synology product line and show you uh, what you can and can't do uh, with the entry point here in their product line. A lot of times these are uh, good enough for what most people are looking for, and then down the road if you need to upgrade, you can actually pull the drives out of here and migrate uh, to a larger, more robust unit. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well in the video. Now, I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure, this is on loan from Synology. We'll be sending it back to them when we're done with this review. I should also mention that Synology is an occasional sponsor here on the channel, but they are not sponsoring this video. So all the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is reviewing this content before I upload it, and no one has paid for this video either. So let's get into this thing and see what makes it work. So let's take a closer look now at the hardware. In many ways, the exterior casing here hasn't changed all that much. This looks a lot like the low-end uh, DS214 I looked at about three years ago, but there are some changes inside. Uh, so this one is powered with a 1.3 gigahertz dual core ARM processor. It also has 512 megabytes of RAM, uh, which is up from 256 megabytes of RAM from uh, that prior edition. So it can do a little more as far as the types of services it can put on your network because it just has more memory to play with and it performs a little better too for uh, reading and writing data back to the disk. Uh, not much to see here on the front. We're going to power it up in a minute, but you have some status lights here to give you an idea as to how your drives are uh, functioning in addition to your network indicator. Your power button is over here. On the back, you have a cooling fan, which, believe it or not, is not all that loud. It is a large fan, so it's able to keep the entire uh, device here relatively cool without generating all that much noise. And uh, in my testing, I had it next to my uh, little workstation all day today, and I'm hearing the hard drives more than I'm hearing the fan. On the bottom here, you've got a gigabit Ethernet jack for connecting it up to your network. It requires that. Uh, you can, I believe, use a wireless adapter, which is not included through the USB here, but I do recommend always connecting these devices up to your router with an Ethernet cable for the best performance. I've covered uh, a lot of this kind of stuff on my uh, NAS 101 video that I'll link to down below in the video description so you can get a good idea as to uh, all the specifics about this technology. And then we've got two USB 3.0 ports over here, and you can plug Plug in uh, external hard drives for doing backups, for example. I'll touch on the backup uh, process in a little bit, but you could also connect up a printer to it and have it work as a print server. Uh, so you can do uh, quite a few things with these USB 3 ports that uh, will make your life a little easier. Uh, the best way to think about these devices is that they are little servers, and uh, what's nice is that they consume less power than a computer might running 24 hours a day. So uh, they rate the power on this one to be about uh, 17 or 18 watts when it's under load and operating, and then uh, the standby power consumption when the uh, device is on but the drives are sleeping are about 7 watts. So it'll be a lot less than uh, having a computer with a couple of hard drives installed in it, for example, yet uh, when you're transferring files back and forth on your network, you'll get about the same performance, which is uh, where these things come into play. Now, as I mentioned, these do not come with a drive installed. You have to uh, get your own drives. Now, they uh, packed in a couple of uh, large ones for me to test with here, two 10 terabyte drives. Now, it's important to note when you're looking at a uh, dual at NAS device like this one is that the default is to have these drives mirror each other. So I don't have 20 terabytes available to me. I just have 10 uh, because these drives are synced up together so that if one drive were to fail, I can pull this one out, put another one in, and not have any loss of data. And what's really neat about the way these Synology drives work is that they keep operating uh, even if the drive is out. So you can uh, basically swap out drives here and keep going. This one I don't believe supports hot swapping just because you have to take it apart to get these drives installed on it. But uh, generally, you will uh, have very little downtime if you lose a drive. But if you lose both drives, of course, uh, you're in trouble, which is why you always need to make sure you back these things up. So the hard drives go in here. Uh, you just put the cover back on, and then uh, it will automatically configure itself to uh, get everything up and running. Now, if you really wanted to get the full 20 terabytes, you can configure it to do that. But again, uh, you have le less redundancy, and in some configurations, you might uh, lose the entire uh, storage array altogether, even if one drive goes down. Now, for drives, uh, one of the things that I recommend doing is looking at a NAS certified drive. Seagate 
has one called the Iron Wolf, which is what they put in this uh, loaner unit we're running with right now. And then WD also has a line of drives called their Red Drives that are also designed for network attached storage. And in fact, I've been using uh, Red Drives on my Synology drive that's been running for the last three and a half years and have had zero issues with those drives. And they are constantly getting uh, pinged and are us usually under load here during the day when we're uh, transiting video files back and forth. So I had very good luck with those. I've heard good things about uh, the Iron Wolf here. Uh, one thing on the Iron Wolf drives is that they do uh, have a special diagnostic screen on the control panel for the uh, Synology drive here to do some additional diagnostics. So again, these things are really geared to towards this. I have run uh, cheap desktop drives in NASA's before, but I have found that they do fail a lot faster, especially given that they're going to be running longer perhaps in one of these than they might be uh, in a PC that might get shut down at the end of the day. So you can save a little money on the drives, but uh, my advice is uh, get the peace of mind and a drive that's designed for this usage. And usually these NAS drives have a little better warranty on them also. I looked on Amazon before I started shooting. You can get a two terabyte uh, NAS drive, both from Seagate and WD uh, for about $85 right now. So get two of those, about $170 plus the cost of entry here, and you'll be up and running for uh, just under $400. So let's take a look now and see what you can do with one of these things, namely the least expensive one in the product line. So I've got everything uh, hooked up now. You can see the lights are blinking. So we've got uh, some good connectivity going here. I'm going to show you first the interface for this that you uh, access through your web browser. So I'm on uh, Google Chrome here. I've connected to the IP address here on my internal network of the uh, Synology NAS device. And I have a lot of stuff that I can do just within my web browser here. And in many ways, it feels like I'm logged into another computer. You can move windows around. You can browse all the files on the uh, drive here. In uh, some cases, you can actually play back videos or uh, look at text files and that kind of thing. There's a bunch of other additional functionality that I'll uh, touch on in a minute. So they've really got a nice interface here. It's very easy to go in and uh, add users, for example. So you could have uh, folders restricted that only you can get access to or you can uh, bring in additional users like I've done here with this test user and allow them to access different uh, shares on your particular device. So you do have a lot of flexibility as to what you can offer people. And uh, one of the things that I like about using one of these uh, out of the box solutions is that Synology does a very good uh, job of giving you regular updates to this. So it's running essentially Linux inside of it, open source uh, software for the most part. There's obviously some proprietary Synology things going on in there, but they are constantly pushing down updates and basically maintaining this for you uh, without any fee required. So I think it's kind of a nice thing that you can uh, get this thing, plug it in, uh, not really think about it all that much and have it continually update itself in the background, which has been uh, really helpful. And of course, you've got a lot of uh, deep configuration that you can do on it. You can really spend a good amount of time uh, accessing the device. Now, in addition to having this interface, you also will see this thing. Let me go over to the right window here. It'll also show up on your network as a uh, drive that you can access like any other computer. So you can see here, I've got all the different devices currently on my network, and then we've got the DS218J here uh, showing up as a much more robust icon in uh, Mac OS 10 here, but I can click on that and get access to all of my file shares once I uh, connect in with my username and password. This will look very similar on Windows as well, so you can uh, log in and basically just use this like any network drive would be used from your computer directly. So you can use their apps and their con connectivity through their web browser application there, or you can just connect your computer up over the network with it and access it that way. Now, when you are away from home, you do have to access the drive in different ways. And I've covered some of those different things you can do uh, down below in the video description. Uh, Synology does offer a service so that you can uh, connect to your drive remotely without having to do anything crazy with your router. And you can point their uh, iOS and Android apps at it. And there's also some desktop clients you can use to uh, get at your files while you're away. Uh, my favorite one is one that actually works kind of like Dropbox. You specify which folders you wish to sync up uh, on the NAS device here. It'll copy those files to your computer's hard drive. And then as you update or change things, it automatically synchronizes back and forth, even over the internet, uh, back to the NAS device here. So you can kind of roll your own Dropbox, essentially, uh, which is one of the strengths of uh, this product line. They have a lot of flexibility for that. And that was something I covered a little earlier. So you can check out uh, how that feature works in depth down below in the video description. Now, this is a low-end device, but there are a lot of different features you can install on it. But you have to be careful 
careful because if you put too many things on, you might uh, slow down the device or uh, cause some other issues for yourself. Because as you can see here right now, I've got about 64% of my uh, RAM already occupied by a lot of the stuff I have running here in the background. And they have this thing called the Package Center that uh, is basically their app store. And you can spend a lot of time here just grabbing all this free stuff to add functionality to your device. But all of this stuff is going to start eating up RAM on here. So uh, you kind of, when you first get these things, you're kind of like a kid in the candy store installing all these open source apps that are so easy to get up and running, but uh, eventually you might run out of memory. So just be careful about what you put in and kind of narrow it down to the few things that you wish to use. Now I've covered a lot of these different features in other videos. So again, check out the uh, playlist down below to see what those things are. Uh, this one runs most of the things that a consumer might want to run. So all that cloud syncing stuff that I talked about is built into this one. You can have this sync up with popular cloud services. Uh, the Hyper Backup, which is an awesome way to get your data backed up both locally onto an external hard drive, but also uh, out over the internet is on here. Uh, there's just about everything I'm seeing on some of the higher end models, minus some of the enterprise things that uh, you can get access to on this. The one thing that this thing does not do well with is video serving because uh, this does not support transcoding video. And if you have been following my Plex series, which is a popular uh, media server, that's something that people often want because if you have a huge video file on your NAS device, but you want to stream it to your phone while you're away from home, uh, that video does need to get converted into a smaller version so it can be played on a mobile device. This will not do any of that. Uh, so even with their own application, it will not transcode, nor will it do that with the Plex server that you can install on here too. So that's a, a limitation that you'll run into with this. But a lot of the other stuff is uh, freely available here. You can run an Apache web server, a database server. You can even have this work as a VPN server for uh, getting into your network remotely and securely when you're not at home. Uh, again, so much stuff here to play with that uh, really can all be installed on this device and uh, be a really good starting point for even web development for that matter. And again, because they're keeping an eye on all of the back end stuff and the OS updates, you don't have to worry about any of those things. Those packages will just update as they go. So for example, on my Synology device in the closet, I have it running a MySQL server. I play around with some little web development uh, hobbyist things that I've been playing with on there as well. I can do all those things behind my firewall uh, just through the Synology NAS there in addition to just serving up files around the network. Now, one thing I did notice is that the 214J is a lot faster than the 214SE we reviewed about three years ago. In fact, it writes data over the network about twice as fast. We're getting speeds of about 104 megabytes per second right now as we're running the Blackmagic Disk speed test and reading a little bit faster, around 110 megabytes or so. Uh, if you do the math here, we can look at, uh, let's do the 104.3 there, and we're uh, getting about 834 megabits per second over the network. Uh, my laptop here is connected via gigabit ethernet, as is the Synology NAS. You never get the full gigabit on your gigabit ethernet network because of overhead and everything else. So uh, all in very, very good performance. And in fact, as good as much more expensive NAS devices are uh, on the same uh, gigabit ethernet connection here. Uh, one thing to note though, is that you might see a performance decline as more people start hitting the device. And if people are running some things in the background using some of those apps they installed, uh, that of course will impact performance on this one a little more than it might on the more expensive one. But uh, for an office of maybe four or five people, this is really good uh, performance here. And uh, you can also have it do some additional things. Now, one thing that I was doing with my uh, old uh, low-end Synology NAS, after I was done with it, I brought it into my uh, office and we used it for the marketing department to store all of our uh, graphics and imagery. And we were having that data sync up automatically with Google Drive as well. So we were able to serve all that media out to everybody in the office at uh, adequate enough speed for everybody and also have it sync up to the cloud uh, in the background. We had unlimited uh, storage on Google Drive also, so we had no limit to uh, what we could put up there, and it handled it all very nicely in the background. We never had to think about it. In fact, I think it's still running uh, over there doing that task. And they also have an encryption feature on here where you can encrypt the folder in addition to locking it down with usernames and passwords, and that will uh, bog this down a little bit more from a performance standpoint. So we're going to take that same speed test now and point it at that encrypted folder, and you can see here we're writing at a significantly slower speed. We were over 100 megabytes per second before. Uh, now we're doing about 29 megabytes per second or so. 
and seeing about 50 megabytes on the reads. And you can also see what that is doing currently to the CPU on the device because it has to encrypt and decrypt uh, all of that information that's being written out to disk. So it can do it, uh, but that's something that will uh, certainly impact the drive a lot more. And if you are in a multi-user environment where everybody is hitting these encrypted folders, that might be an area where this thing might start to get uh, bogged down a little more than it might be with just uh, general unencrypted files going back and forth with it. So uh, there are things you can do with it that might be better for one or two users, and uh, there are things that might be able to serve more users depending on what those tasks are. But again, because you're on the low end here, you have to kind of keep an eye on this system health widget here just to see if the things you're installing and running are uh, going to negatively impact performance. But uh, by and large, I think it will uh, work well for most small offices that are looking just for a basic NAS that can do a little bit more than the basics. So all in, not a bad little device at the low end. It certainly performs better than uh, the prior edition we looked at a couple of years back. It's saturating my gigabit ethernet connection as we saw earlier. So you're able to uh, move files in and out. Like I said, I think this is good for a small office or maybe even a single use kind of purpose. If you're getting into some larger stuff, you might want to go for one of the more expensive units. And what's cool is that uh, you can get this one and try it out and see if it works for you. And if you do eventually need to go to a more robust device, uh, you can just pull the drives out of here, put them in a larger Synology device, and everything will just migrate over automatically without having to go through a big restore and rebuild. I did a video on that down below in the master playlist so you can see what that process was. In fact, I upgraded from my uh, 214 SE over to a uh, four drive unit that was a little faster. And then I was able to, uh, after doing that migration, put in two more drives and automatically expand the amount of storage that I had available to me too. It was actually a pretty uh, easy process and the video wasn't all that long demonstrating it. So there are some very easy ways to upgrade uh, down the road once you might outgrow perhaps what uh, you've got running on the one here. But uh, all in a pretty nice way to get started with a Synology NAS drive, and I think it might uh, work well in a single user environment for sure, and maybe even uh, a decent sized small office too, depending on the kinds of things that you're running in the background on it. Let me know if you have any questions down below in the comment stream. We've got a big playlist of hours of content on uh, all these different Synology features uh, down below in the video description. So check out those videos, and if you want to see something in more depth, uh, let me know in the comment section as I'm getting caught up here at the end of the year, I'm going to try to get to a few more uh, Synology videos talking about some of the features that I am using on a regular basis. This is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters, the Black Eyed and Blues Music Hour podcast, Chris Allegretta, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.